You're listening to Disrobing the Mosh Pit, a dissection of music and popular culture, with your hosts, Pete and Tom. Here we are again. How's it oh, going? Hi, good. And yourself? Good, man. Good, good. Hello to all those uh, listeners out there. Hope everyone's had a good last couple of weeks. Mm. Yeah, how about you, Pete? How was your last couple of weeks? Yeah, good, thanks, man. Yep. 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 We're all out of lockdown now, so back into work, is it? Yeah, yeah, pretty uh, pretty low-key work. Not really a lot going on at the moment. Yeah. Not, a lot of, not a lot of travel between here and Auckland, let's put it that way. So yeah. mainly going south and it's being spread out a bit. So there's not a lot of work really uh, going on. Yep. But I've that's been, fine with me, to be honest. It's totally fine with me. That's cool. I've been back in the back in the classroom in front of the students again. Okay. So yeah, it's interesting, the whole Zoom thing with, with teaching. And I guess the the differences that you have in person and and uh, online there, you know, some people really th- really dislike the the online teaching, and then some people really like it. Mm. I actually really like it. Yeah, it's great. well, it means you can duck off and raid your own pantry. Yeah, excuse me for a moment. I'm just gonna sift off over here and get yeah. this big loaf of bread and. You know? And more importantly, pants are optional. Yeah, you know? yeah you're right. only going through a computer. You have to, then you have to go, you know, go <laughs> like crouch down as you're yeah. going to the kitchen. You don't want to screw that up. You don't want to get <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. someone knock the computer screen and, and all of a sudden the, the the front goes down and shows that you're just in your tidy whities. <laughs> <laughs> you got tidy whities? Yeah, oh, somewhere. <laughs> so, what have you been listening to? Uh, this week it's been um, a bit of a mixed bag. Actually, I did a bit oh. of a Veruca Salt. Yes, nice. Uh, I think I was talking with Tom about this a bit earlier. But um, during lockdown, um, one of my best friends sent me a challenge to do a version of particular songs. And anyway, we were sending songs back and forth um, between each other to do our own interpretations of songs. And one song that he chose was a Veruca Salt Volcano Girls. So anyway, that's been thrashed a bit. My daughter has been loving it. So now that's pretty much your go-to for the drive to and from school. And um, that's such a great idea. Yeah, it was it was really good fun because I mean you got a lot of time at home and the kids love to get involved. So it was it's kind of like a glorified karaoke. You know? Yeah, <laughs> but luckily no one has to sort of endure yeah. your renditions when you're hammered. So that's quite good, except for one person yeah. and their family. Yeah, that's great, yeah. man. Yeah, what else did you do? What other songs? Um, so what else did we do? We did. Oh, you did some. You did some rapping, eh? Yeah. So we did right. the Snoop Dogg. I did Snoop Dogg, G's and Hustlers, and I tell you, that is really hard. It, it, it gave you a really good insight into how difficult it actually is to flow, and how um, skilled they are. Yeah, and skilled people are at, at actually the flow. Oh my god, it's so difficult. You said the first couple of takes, I just had to delete because it's like I, I can't even stand this. <laughs> it's really bad. And it's amazing when people sort of think about hip hop and rappers and they kind of simplify things. Like you know, the older generations are I want to do. They sort of go, oh, you know, they they just talk, they don't see it as necessarily being particularly musical a lot of the time. But just the individuality that's in that flow with a lot of these rappers, mm. eh? It's like really, really different. Mm. Snoop, it's almost like you don't need to hear the words, you can hear the rhythm and you just know that it's that it's him. Mm. You know, it's He's got a real music. laid back way where it sort of slightly drags, but it's yeah. really awesome. Like it's really hard to replicate. And I didn't replicate, let's be honest. Um, and I had listened to Dr. Dre. I was like, there's no way in hell I'm going to be able to do any of this. Awesome. It was far too difficult. Yeah. The phrasing's so difficult. Yeah, next week, busy bone. Yeah, no, okay. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Watch me butcher that. Oh, How about you, Tom? What's been what's been on high rotation at the Pierrot household? Well, pretty much I think we've been thrashing that Yeba Tiny Desk mm. uh, performance, which is pretty, pretty special. A lot of those Tiny Desk ones are really cool. And you sort of get the feeling that – I guess a lot of the bands are halfway through a tour, mm. you know, and so they're coming in and they sort of have changed the show around a little bit to be acoustic and to sort of downscaled it. But that was pretty special. I feel like it was like really polished, mm. like, a, like a proper rehearsed live performance. They'd done a lot of work on it, man. So it's she's a pretty phenomenal singer anyway, but the rest of her band was just like killer. Mm. That's really cool. Well, I, I, when I listened to that Yeba Tiny Desk, <clears throat> and in fact any Yeba, she sounds so pitch perfect that she sounds like she's been auto tuned. It's not saying yeah, my kids thought the same thing. I, I thought there's no way a human can be like that, like perfect all the way through. Like there's got to be some wavering of your human. Yeah, right? she's she's been called a singer's singer quite often. I think people call her that. Mm-hmm. 
And I think you can tell when you listen to that stuff, it's not particularly poppy. It's kind of complex mm. behind it. The, the 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 structure of the song and that kind of the form of it is quite complicated. Mm. I don't think it's really pop music. It wouldn't be suited as being pop music. There's a topic I thought for another time, maybe like what makes music pop. But anyway, in this, it's really good to go and check out because I think obviously she's got these amazing pipes, and um, but it's not maybe not accessible for everyone because it's a little bit sort of complicated. Yeah, I think people can appreciate. Amazing for sure, singer, right? Yeah, mm. I've been thrashing that though. I've been listening to it pretty much every day. Yeah. <laughs> the As you get up brushing so your teeth, good. oh yeah, yeah, oh, they're on. so good. It, it just runs through your head. But that's been me through the last nice. kind of week, anyway. Awesome. Yeah. So, what do you want to talk about tonight? Well, I thought we might um, talk about uh, um, how we access music in our generation, I suppose, mm. or maybe a generation before. But how how the evolution. Uh, of how we get our musical fix effectively yeah. has evolved over time, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, great. I suppose chronologically from back in the day when it was, you know, just being performed. Mm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we – oh, yeah, yeah. Well, well, obviously that hasn't gone out of style that time. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I think, um, you know, obviously in our lifetime with our parents that was um, recordings – recordings existed but just with the advent of streaming and stuff it's just gone you know in a whole new directions mm, but, totally so so we had a little bit of homework to do where we maybe got a few insights into how our parents did things how mm. they were introduced to music so what what, what did you find well uh, obviously uh with my mum she lived in vietnam uh through the sort of her formative years and certainly up until sort of about the mid 60s and um, she described how she got her sort of musical fix, mm. mainly through musical theatre um, and a lot of folk music um, through musical theatre and on TV, which was sort of relatively early days there, black and white, and there's a bit of music on TV. Yeah. Um, and then it wasn't really until she came to New Zealand that it started becoming more like records and record players, et cetera, mm. et cetera. Yeah. So I guess there's not a lot of – I mean – I found the same thing, like with with my parents. They were this was this must have been my dad was born what fifty five, so just the sixties. And I guess like there was limited opportunity for exploration, wasn't mm. there? It's kind of especially being in little old New Zealand. Oh yeah, basically you take what you're given. When there's a new record that comes in, and everyone's you know goes and 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 it's the talk of the town basically when you can go in and buy it but but society really sort of looked down on your taste of music didn't they or the it seemed to me certainly through the 50s that you know if you listen to a certain genre of music elvis presley or something like that mm. um, they really sort of like you know you were labeled of a troublemaker and you know rebellious yeah. really rebellious yeah you know? subversive yeah the devil's music. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, <laughs> it was. It was a lot more sort of conservative, I guess. Yeah, I don't then. know if that's going to change. Yeah, with with generations, people just go, oh god, hands over the ears when you hear what what your kids are listening to. You know, mm, I think that's just, yeah, that's true. just kind of always going to be the way. My parents were certainly like that anyway. But I think the big difference there with with how I got hold of music and how they did was, I guess, there's just that many. I mean, you know, obviously, in the we're talking the early '90s here when I started to started to seek out music and, and buy it and that kind of thing, uh, it was tape cassettes, yeah. you know? So we're going from, from, from them with the records and I think zooming ahead <clears throat> 30 years and something that you don't see much these days at all, the cassette tape. No, yeah. no, you don't see much in the way of cassettes these days. Yeah. In fact, it's really hard to even play a cassette these days. Well, there's the big thing with that, you know, with, with the tapes. Because it was the first time it became portable, right? With a Walkman. Yeah. Did you own a Walkman? I did. Yeah, I did own a Walkman. And that... what tapes did you have? Wait, you definitely you had Backstreet Boys, didn't you? Can nah. I remember you saying no. West, what? 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 Uh, Nukas on the block. Nukas on the block. Yeah. yeah. Which were effectively the early '90s, late '80s version of Backstreet Boys. Yep. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I really had a tape of them though. A lot of tapes that I had. Um, were mixed tapes. Oh yeah, bringing us to a really, really important way, kind of in the in our formative years, eh? Yes, hitting the old play plus record. 
her play plus record. Yeah, on the tape decks. Yeah, and, and recording. It was critical in the timing, yeah, that you did there. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Recording the right, you're talking about recording always from the radio? Yeah. Yeah. And th- didn't that always like annoy the hell out of you when you were recording songs? Well, you'd waited all day mm-hmm. for like a song, a particular song to come on. Maybe you'd seen it like being played or like a snippet of being played on an ad or something. You're like, oh, this song, I love it. And you knew it was being played on, you know, Hot 93 or something. Hot 93, yeah. yeah. Jason Reeves, he's there. And um, you'd be waiting all day and then you know, the song's coming on and the DJ just talking over the first part of it. You're like, oh, for God's sake, uh, just shut up. Yeah. And then like, and then they go, and that was it at the very end and that was blah, blah, blah. You're like, oh, for God's sake, you just ruined the entire recording. Like, you know, oh, yeah, yeah. the meat of it. But I've got like this guy talking on the front and the end of it. Yeah, yeah there's something about having to sit through it and record it in real time. Mm. And, of course, you couldn't do anything more romantic than making a mixtape for someone, could you? Hey, no, and how could you? Oh, yeah, God, yeah. <laughs> Throw a little love note in there, like <laughs> yeah. written on a 1B5. Um, did you <laughs> – how did you even know that a song was coming on though, Tom? I think there was a count – there was like a countdown, right? Like a top 40, there was like a countdown, hot hot number 10 or something like that. I guess we, we didn't – yeah, because was cause, it in the paper? Did they? Nah. Well, well, I can remember that. I can remember them saying like, "This is the hot 20 that they played at seven pm or something but like that. But how did you know what was on the hot twenty? Well, it would be similar from the night before because they were, they would move around a little bit. But I guess you'd sit there hoping that the same song was on in that countdown. I seem to remember they used to have the list of the songs, you know, the top twenty or top one hundred, probably top twenty. Yeah, um, in the paper. And then they'd have uh, the arrows going up and down, like where they were, you know, being listed. Ooh, do you yeah, remember that? That's ringing some bells. Yeah, you'd yeah. do the Daily Telegraph, and you'd go, "There it is. There's the list of the top ten songs." Yeah. And you're like, "Okay, cool." And so if they played on the radio, I'd be like, "Okay, so they're going to play the top ten. I know that it's going to be." At oh my five. god, that's so laborious, but like kind of in a good way, right? Like it's just right, like you'd special. Go, you'd, you'd crawl over broken glass for you. Yeah. Play song. Oh my god, and I think that you could also request them, right? Yeah, you so, could. Yeah. Did you ever get through to the radio station? Once or twice, like yeah. max, I think. Yeah. yeah. Did you have to like wait on the phone line for the DJ to pick up? I think it was really rare to actually get through. Yeah. Like it would be almost almost certainly 99% of the time just like beep, beep, beep. Yeah, yeah you get the busy signal or like hang yeah. up like it's engaged or, you know, everyone's yeah. ringing. God damn it. Yeah. Did yeah, so- you ever make a mixtape for – you know, the love of your life in primary school. Oh, <clears throat> I think I, I didn't, I didn't actually make a mixtape for anyone. I don't think I definitely recorded stuff and went through the whole what we've talked about before the process of recording and learning lyrics that way. Mm-hmm. Going back, recording it off the radio, rewind, play, pause, rewind. You know, all that kind of stuff. How laborious is that? I, yeah. I did it today because I was talking to Tom prior to recording this podcast because I found a whole bunch of my old band's tapes. Mm. And there's a, there's a way We're going to have can, to play some. We're going to have to put some music oh, in there. Yeah, and you guys would be stunned a bit, I'm sure. <laughs> um, but um, I forgot how laborious it is to rewind a tape from the end to the start. Oh, man. Oh, man, it takes so long. And then you don't know where it is. You're like, I think I think it's here. No, it's not. No, oh, and then keep, keep, keep going. I think it's on the other side. Like, and then eject and then take it out and put it back around the other side. And, oh, and I now have to fast forward. And Yeah, man, VH, VHS tapes were, were terrible for that too. Remember oh, rewinding a movie before you took it back to the, yes. the video store? There's two ways you could do it though. You could play it and rewind it and it would be really slow. Yeah. Or you could stop it and rewind it. It was real fast. Yeah. Yeah, but super still, speed. That would be like five minutes. <laughs> Oh, unless I'm my unless my perception is totally warped on it these days, but yeah, it took ages. Oh, hey. So, did you make a mixtape for someone? I can't remember making a mixtape for anyone. Actually, I think I could see you doing that. You're a bit of a romantic, hey? Oh, yeah, I'm so romantic. <laughs> no, I, I mean I made a mixtape for myself. Does that count? <laughs> that counts. <laughs> I romance myself. Love thyself. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I de- yeah definitely make a few mixtapes. Or like you know, um, your dub tapes. Of your friends, so yeah. like if your mates had, ah, yes. you know, you'd, yep. they'd buy like the Trip Four or something, yeah, um, and then you go, I love that album. Then you like, you'd buy a blank tape and then you'd record their tape. You had to have those like, like a uh, Ghetto Blasters with the two tape decks, eh? Yeah, One and of- you'd also have to get because do you remember the tapes on the top that have the tabs broken off so you couldn't yeah. dub them? Yeah, and then you had to put tape, tape over, over the top it. of them. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> right. Yeah, same with VHS as well. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> the tab in the front. Was it the front tab? Yeah. And you put yeah. tape over it? Yeah. 
So where would you go to – how did you – how were you learning about music? It was just the radio at that time. Just radio, yeah. It was mainly radio, I think. So when did you start going to record stores, CD stores, stage oh, that's stores? That's really difficult. I can remember yeah. probably my earliest memory of record stores was going to – it was EMI Music, and it's where, for those of you that live in the lovely – city of Napier. It was where Glassons is on Emerson Street in Napier. <laughs> yeah. Do you remember that? Yeah. And I remember them having a big sale, and I that's where I bought my first CD, and that was uh, New Kids on the Block, Hanging Tough. Hanging Tough. Yeah. yeah. Nice. It yeah. Was, it was great. And I, I think my first CD single was O Carolina by Shaggy, but I got that in Australia. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice. I might have talked about it before, but the first CD that I got was – uh, from my gran, and it was Prodigy, Fat of the Land. Did your gran get you Prodigy? She Fat didn't of the know Land? about the content. Obviously. <laughs> well, maybe she did. But it would have been hilarious, right? Her going into the CD store yeah. and buying it. <laughs> Could I get Fat of the Land by the Prodigy? <laughs> yeah. He's like, you know, the one with Smack My Bitch Up on it. <laughs> That's the one. Fire yeah. Starters, Fire Starter on yeah, 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 yeah. Fire Starters on there. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, but with the, the CD cover with the crab on the, the crab on the front. Crab, but, yeah, that's man, right. I got I got a t-shirt with it and everything. Did and you? Like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That was another big thing, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, getting t-shirts with t-shirts, albums. T-shirts, yeah, yeah. And I think I got hold of that. I think I maybe uh, sussed that out because at that stage it was like the RTR countdown was on. Pepsi yep. RTR countdown. Oh, Pepsi R. Would Robbie Rakate? Yeah, yeah, Robbie. Yeah. yeah, that's right. And at the end of it, it's like, da ding ding da 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 ding ding da yeah. That ship going along. Remember that? <laughs> that's right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Way back in the day. <clears throat> and so I think that was from that that I started seeing groups like that. And I thought, okay, well, maybe I'll just start, start investing in some CDs. Got a boombox. Um, Did you have a Walkman? Did you have a Walkman? Yeah, I had a CD, a CD man, a blue one. Yeah, I had a, I had a blue Walkman. It was a blue Walkman. I yeah, remember okay, one yeah. Christmas, we, my sister and I got Walkmans for Christmas, and hers was like a kind of a maroon, ready one, and mine was blue. Kind of se- sexist, actually, when you think about it. Because <laughs> you come to think about it now, why, why didn't I get the ready blue one? She, yeah. ready maroon one, she got the blue one. Anyway, I remember that. But my dad got one at the same time, and his one had mega bass boost on oh. it. Always wanted to nick his <laughs> one because it was so grunty. <laughs> it's funny, you know, I think like we take it for granted now. Of course, because we have our phones with us. But to give someone, I guess, to have the ability of being mobile with music back then, oh oh, man, life changing, eh? So life changing. Big ass chunky headphones or like really crappy plastic kind of thin light headphones. But whatever it was, it was just, oh man, I've got my Walkman. It's pretty cool. And I remember on my one, it had like an, it's sort of like instead of a mega bass boost thing, it had like an anti shock button that you push down. Oh. As if, like, you'd ever not have that on. Was it the Discman one? <laughs> yeah, it was a Discman, yeah. Did you ever find with Discmans, though, that they always skipped? Oh, Rega- yeah. Regardless yeah. of, yeah. not only did they skip, but yeah, if your CD had a scratch in it, yeah. it was just the most infuriating thing. That's where tapes were good. They were way yeah. more robust. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's interesting because they're so chunky, CD players, right? <laughs> yeah, it's ridiculous. It's just, it's just like you have this thing that's like a toasting machine. <laughs> Like like hooked onto one of your jeans I pockets. A, I would take a toasty machine. Yeah, that's that, that, that's a bad analogy because you want to carry a toasty machine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, they're so huge. It's interesting that they lasted as long as they did, actually. Yeah, I know. I, I can remember – do you remember people like having the bags? Like, they were like basically shoulder bags with a discman in it. Oh, no. I remember having a oh, – dare I say it, I had a bum bag – Nice. With, they had my disc man. <laughs> um, it looked like Dwayne Johnson mm. of The Rock, you know, in his early days. <laughs> yeah. um, but yeah. um, no, people had like, you know, like the shoulder bag. You know, people used to have the canvas bag. I think I know. You know yeah. the one I'm talking about? Like, like black. They're usually black. And they they just they fit the disc man and maybe like four CDs, you know? Yeah. Yeah. There'd be a, be a thing to take it to town. A little magazine clip with, yeah, yeah. with, with CDs in there. Oh, man, that's awesome. Yeah. So I guess that, that kind of did its dash. But that would have been for a long time. And yeah. I guess with regards to how we're getting stuff, there was a long period there where I think you get told what to listen to on, on TV or the radio, but then there's this special time when you go to like a record store. Hey, and they mm-hmm. had these listening posts, right? And so, which m- posts, yeah. probably now a thing of the past, except for in vinyl stores. Listening posts. Oh, yeah, man, you fully have like, 
Awoke in a, a memory. Yeah. Yeah, well, I worked in a CD store for a little while. Did you? There. Yep, Electric City Music in did, town. Did you actually work at ECM? Yeah, with, with old Dean. Dean was my boss no there. No way. He was a good dude. Yeah, I think um, I just basically, I must have been for like one or two summers, I think. Wow. Yeah, it was cool. And so, I mean, basically, that was actually really cool because you could, it's actually quite a nice thing to recommend some music that someone listens to something and then see their reaction if they kind of like it. Mm. And this is back in the time when I guess it still had that currency that it doesn't necessarily have today because mm. of streaming. Mm. So I remember, actually really remember, I think I played someone, um, that Incubus album, Science. You guys got to you gotta check this out. And just there while they're sitting in the listening post listening to it and they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just yelling across the shop. Giving the thumbs up kind of thing. It's good. That's another thing, eh, like with um, music stores that we, you sort of miss out on now is the thumbing through the, you know, the alphabet, the, the Dewey Decimal System of yeah. the CDs. Yeah. So you'd like, you know, there's D. I'm going to have a look through that. And then there's like, oh, there's the Disturbed CD. And then you have to like move your way through. And then, you know, they're all like organized, cataloged and sort of both alphabetically and, and genres. Yeah. That and the giant rack with the posters. That you could like with the big cardboard. Oh thing, yeah, the yeah, big, yeah, it's like yeah. almost like an accordion file, but like, but a giant, like a giant oh, accordion God. file. Yeah, and I can still remember it. I can still remember what it sounds like. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, and yeah, I love this poster. Can I get this poster here? And it yeah, comes in like they can roll it up and take it home. Did you go in for many band shirts? Yeah, man. Yeah, I, I, I can't remember getting a lot. I'm pretty sure I remember space. seeing you in a silver chair shirt. Did you have any silver chair no, apparel? I, I don't think I ever had a silver chair shirt. Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> Did you I imagine me in a silver chair shirt? This is getting oh, quite awkward. I, 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 yeah, <laughs> I'm sure I'd see I'm sure I'd, Like a frog stomp one, maybe no, or something no, else. No, I school. never had a silver chair shirt. I I had oh, I had a Soundgarden shirt. Nice. I had a, the the um, Super Unknown. I had that one album. too, yeah. Oh, and yeah. The, I had a pretty noose one, which was a bit. Oh yeah, ding, ding, ding. yeah. That was such a cool. That was like Super Unknown was an amazing album, mate. Eh? Well, you hit pretty hard when when Chris Cornell did you like? Just, yeah, like, it was just a bit of a quite sad, eh? Yeah, I, I say was quite like, sad, very uh, sad. Yeah, yeah. That's probably one of my greatest regrets and never seeing Soundgarden live. Yeah, yeah. I've Matt never, Cameron was a great drummer too. Eh? Yeah, plus a Pearl Jam. Now. What about after that? So you've got your big CD wallet, right? You had those big CD wallets. Yeah. It's hard to, like I was saying just before we started recording, I haven't held a CD, a physical CD, in a few years now. Mm. <laughs> but the thing is that they're so, particularly with CDs, I think they sort of they represent a, a, a stage in your life which you loved potentially, but they were relatively formative. Yeah. Um, and you're sort of quite reluctant to give them away. Oh, I don't, yes, I don't want to give away my totally. CDs. Like, yeah. I've got like heaps of CDs. I know and they're certainly at mum and dad's, probably clogging up their CD collection. But um, I, I, don't, I would never be able to give them to you know the the tape CD book collection thing. Place yeah, I couldn't do that. I put all mine into a wallet, and so I don't have any of the cases still. But th do you regret? Did something? Did you ever get the sleeve and put that in the wallet with it? No. Um, oh, no. Tom, what sort of music person are you? This is terrible. <laughs> it was stupid, eh? There was like 50% of like the album was uh, yeah. the sleeve as well. So as a result, I just named every, I just had every, every song was a number to me. I was like, oh, yeah, number three, number seven, number. Oh, yeah. yeah, which I guess you don't, you don't have any more as well. Yeah, that's true. Actually. What about with regards to what was actually influencing your musical taste back then? Because I guess friends play a big part in it. But yep. what about what about some family or some siblings? Were you getting influenced with uh, what was driving your well, er, early on? It would have been my dad, oh, yeah. um, and then like the whole Queen thing, probably a bit of Beatles. Mm. Um, but later on, like I had mentioned, my Shaggy O Carolina yeah. CD single, I was very proud of it at the time. But my sister, way more like she's my sister is three years older than me. And she was alternative, real into alternative music. And uh. the first CD that she bought, CD single that she bought, was Stone Temple Pilots, Plush. Uh. Wow. Yeah. So she was into way more alternative music than I was back then. Yeah. You know, I was into NKOTB and, and Shaggy, and she was yeah. into Stone Temple Pilots <laughs> and Guns N' Roses. <laughs> so she's like way more into rock. And she definitely influenced what I listened to because um, I started getting into rock through her effectively. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And so we sort of moved from like, um, pop effectively into 
into rock and hard rock. It's funny how much siblings play a part in the day. Totally, man. It's a yeah. huge so part. So my sister Lan definitely was a major mm. influence on what I listen to now. Ah. Yeah. See, I had, because my sisters were into, uh, well, yeah, some interesting stuff, but not really, not really heavy stuff. And I think that it was actually their boyfriends that sort of started, you know, started sharing some musical tastes with some of these guys, one in particular. And he played me. I remember he came home, he came round to our house and he was like, check this out, check this out. And he'd recorded it from MTV or something. And it was the corn um, video for Shoots and Letters. Oh, yeah, cool. He was like, check this out, check this out. And we're just like, whoa, like freaking out over it. Yeah, I mean, I mean, he was like a, a high school dude who, who probably had access to some some different stuff. And it was like, whoa, what's this, what's this mm. kind of music? And so from then on, I think like um, he and a few other people were just like feeding into what I was listening to at the time. And then until I was old enough, I guess, to just – go and explore myself and, and CD shops and that kind of thing. Yeah. But then I guess when we were 17, 18, you and I, uh, not so much streaming, but was because YouTube wasn't a thing then, was it? No. no. Are you talking about back in the day with the 14.4 modem? Yeah. Yeah. No, <laughs> YouTube was definitely not around then. In YouTube, fact, I don't even think there was a, a Google existed. Back nah. Then. What, what was it? Like we used There's like, Ask Jeeves. Yeah. There's the dog. The one with the dog? What was that one? Oh, I can't remember. We talked about search engines, right? Ask yeah. Jeeves. There was Netscape Navigator. Did you ever? Wow, yeah, do that's you remember going that back. One? Yeah. yeah. Um, but then, of course. There was a bridging between the musical downloads, though, because it was. Uh, there was mini discs after CDs. Oh, yeah, it true. It to be the next big thing. Yeah. Never took off at all. No. Yeah. You know, usurped by iPods. <laughs> <laughs> so pretty much straight away. Yeah. Yeah. But I guess like prior to the iPods thing, was this like peer-to-peer music sharing? Mm. Hey, and, and I think there were things like LimeWire and Napster and and you would look for things on there because if you weren't going to look for it there, you had to do what was called the importing of CDs. I never quite understood that concept because I was like, aren't all CDs imported? So what was the deal? They did like a special order. For some CDs, I think New Zealand over back in the sort of nineties, early two thousands, they were obviously allocated a certain amount from overseas. But ah, yeah. um, if you wanted to get anything over and above that, or that was not on a catalog, because yeah. I mean, you were in a music store, you would have known that. Yeah, you know, you'd probably order a certain amount of stock in off a catalog, and anything over and above that, you didn't have to ship from overseas. Yeah, so yeah, true. And because of that, it incurred a lot of extra costs. I mean, we're talking about back in the days prior to Amazon and DHL and all yeah. this and stuff like that. Yeah. So it was a hell of a lot more expensive, and it took freaking forever to get some Good, yeah. as well. Yep, took a long time. Did you ever order ever you know ever yep. order any CDs from overseas? Yeah, yeah, about four or five. What What were your pride and joys that you got from? <clears throat> One of them was a band called Stuck Mojo. What was that? <laughs> it's metal. It's actually super cool. Like I really listen, I listened to it again the other day. Did you? Yeah, um, an album called Pig Walk. <laughs> <laughs> Feel man. Yeah, and then another one was um, the Mudvayne album LD Fifty. Oh yeah, and it was kind of before they sort of started doing. Was it before well. Dig? It was the album that Dig was on. Oh yeah. But it was before it sort of became big enough that it was just mainstream, and, and they were just getting it in here. Mm-hmm. Those are the two can I, that I can remember. But I remember they're both being, they're both like fifty bucks each. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, it was a, it was a bit of a pricey ordeal when you're sort of you know making nine dollars an hour or something like that. I, only, I, I can only remember ordering one, and that was the Minor Threat album. That was it. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's good that you made that commitment. Yeah, I committed <laughs> to Minor Threat. Yeah. So so Napster, I guess one of the first file sharing sites and then they uh went down famously because of because of Metallica taking them to court and was there a bit of a hiatus with peer to peer? I think no I think sp- like almost filled the gap straight away with another one called LimeWire. Yeah, yeah, LimeWire. So Napster ran into trouble and then it sort of like went downhill quite considerably. You used to be able to like search like you download Napster, you'd search for your songs. There they were, brilliant. You'd, there'd be so many different selections. Um, and then because of this court case, pretty, pretty much when you search for it, there was nothing because no yeah. one would post their songs up there. Did you ever download songs off Napster? Yep. 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 Did you ever go for the high quality 
one ninety two, or did you just go straight for the one twenty? No, no, I didn't go for the one ninety two. No, yeah, you're right. Yeah, you said that before, and I was going, oh yeah. And now I remember it. Yep, yeah, I, I never did. Yeah, when you dial up on a fourteen point four k modem, <laughs> and you try and download a one twenty eight k song, even that would take half an hour. And the worst thing about that was that if someone rang through yeah. on the landline and it was disconnected, or if someone pick up the phone to make a phone call, you're like, oh, you dick, oh. what? <laughs> you're like, oh man, yeah. I just ruined this download. You did you ever like try multiple downloads? Like, yeah, I think like so. You know, you built up your your MP3s and your CD collection as well, and then all of a sudden, I remember I was quite reluctant to sort of get a member, get a subscription to a streaming service mm. because I kind of liked feeling, nah, I'm controlling what I'm listening to a mm. little bit. But when I did, I was just like, oh, man, game changer. Hey, oh, yeah, totally. When I first sort of got a Spotify account. Did you ever own an iPod? Yeah. Yeah. So that would have been the successor to the disc. Yes, yeah, yeah. And true. that would have been around about the same time as uh, peer-to-peer uh, yeah. downloading, wasn't it? Yeah, that's right, yeah. So you could download a whole bunch of peer-to-peer and stick them on your iPod. Yeah, I remember I had an Apple Classic 160 gig one oh I bought God. in Japan. 160 gigs. Yeah, it was pretty epic. You were rich. Yeah, it was. It was. I think it was about 400 bucks. Oh my God, you were rich. You yeah. were earning nine dollars an hour back then. No, this was this was uh, maybe 2000. Ooh, six, 2006. Okay. Yeah. Ten dollars an hour. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I was outside of outside of uni. At that stage, I'd, I'd, I'd finish uni. Yeah, but I'm being over there and I was like, whoa, 160 gigs. It's like Apple Classic, 160 gigs. Like, Think yep. of all the songs I can fit on that. Yeah. This is interesting, though, because I guess the Spotify thing has just totally replaced. I mean, I mean. How did you ever find out about Spotify? Well, oh, let me think. Well, I got the subscription through a, a phone, a phone member, a phone uh, plan. Yeah, and I think it was basically I sort of think, oh, okay. And it was a while till I activated it, mm. but then I think I just was. I looked for something that I've been I'd been looking to find for a long, long time. I'd probably been looking for torrents of it, mm. and then it was on there, and I was like, oh man. And then of course the floodgates open, and it's all from there. You're just sort of just constantly listening. What do you think that we've lost? You know, obviously we've gained the mobility. We've gained the access and the like, you know, the freedom and in, in all of this, all of this music to explore. Do you think we've lost anything from from having music so accessible? I think we, I sort of touched on this maybe in, in an earlier podcast, but uh, yeah, I do. I think we've definitely lost a bit. I think um, in terms of the whole experience of owning a piece of music, well, not owning the piece of music, but owning the album that of that music, yeah, um, has been kind of lost. In a lot of ways, I mean, look, on, you can go on any streaming service now, and you can listen, to, you can cherry pick pretty much anything you like, and you can add them to your own playlist. So you don't mm. necessarily even have to listen to the entire album. Yeah. There's something that you hear on a radio, or you hear on an ad, or whatever, or someone's recommended something to you. You can um, go through and cherry pick whatever you like. You, you're not you're not so heavily invested. You know, back back in the day when we were younger, and you'd spend thirty dollars on a CD, and you'd have to save up a long time to actually do it yeah. to get it. Now it's not fifteen dollars a month, and you can pretty much listen to anything you like, whenever you like. Yeah, so so that word I was talking about before, currency, music as currency. I guess that, that it's it, in some ways it's been devalued a little. Well, no, owning music has been devalued a little bit. Eh? Mm, yeah, totally. I, I mean, don't... this is the thing, and I, I guess that's why I sort of like harking back to um, why you sort of treasure your CDs from so long ago because you work mm. so hard to get them. And, yeah, and you. Invested so much in them, you know, and you thrash into bits and they scratch mm. to, to all hell and you you try to look after them. Could you you yeah. put them through one of those CD cleaners. Oh, man, you know, yeah. You yeah. know, try to scratch removers, you know, try and like <laughs> rehash the life out of them. Yeah. Maybe people don't invest so much in listening to the same thing over and over again because I guess you listen to the, the song, you learn all the lyrics, you, you, you become familiar with every chord and every rhythm and that kind mm. of thing. Just because you have no other option but to exhaust that that one album, yeah. hey? Oh yeah, totally. And now you don't you don't necessarily have to do that. Yeah, I don't mean to, I don't mean to despair of the whole streaming thing because it's pretty amazing, you know, having that there. But it is interesting thinking about what it means with with regards to the value of owning music. 
you know, and, and how artists tapped into that before that currency and um, were able to charge for their recordings. Because, mm. of course, now it's totally different and, and the artists, what was that, that statistic that I saw? Something like 40,000, was that, was that number? 40,000 songs a day, day. Yeah. uploaded to Spotify and that the top, like, like 90% of the profit well, ninety percent of the of the revenue made in Spotify goes to forty three thousand artists. I think that was the statistic that I saw. Forty three thousand artists, ninety percent of the from profit. like twenty eight million. Wow. Yeah, yeah twenty eight million artists. I think are on there. There was some data from I think last year. So, that's yeah. incredible. I mean, it's it's pretty um, it's pretty it's pretty amazing. So, I tell me something, Tom. Now, if if an album is certified platinum, how how is that judged now? Because it, it can't be through album sales, can it? Or can it be online album sales? I don't know. Because, yeah. you know, I, back I in the day, it, the metric it. would have been a lot easier, wouldn't it? Because you know, all be streams, they had all be streams, I think. So, like, say, like, I don't know, the Lord's newest album, mm-hmm. um, and if, say, she went gold or platinum or whatever. I don't even know if those terms exist anymore. Really? Yeah. I'm, I'm, I don't know if they do. It's a matter of like you know they go to number one in, in a certain country and that kind of stuff, but the the streaming charts play into that in a pretty big way. Mm. And they're so immediate too, eh? Like it used to take like an entire week before like yeah. the charts would change, but now it's like almost hourly or like minute by minute the, the yeah. charts are changing. Yeah, I think there's a certain time during the day that in, the, in New Zealand anyway they flick over mm. something like three p.m. or something like that. I'm gonna be looking at that. At New Zealand 3 PM. top forty charts. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty interesting, eh? I think uh, it's all about streaming, obviously, and streaming numbers. And I think, what was there? Was there a court case a little while ago with one of the big labels? I won't speculate here, but it was one of them got in trouble for diddling the numbers, I guess, because you used to have these like a… Uh, what were diddling? Diddling like sort of, you know, um, pulling the wool over our eyes and, you know, fake. It's fol- a funny word. It's a real like, little kid's word. If you diddle someone, you mislead them, you know? Yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> they diddle the numbers, I think, and they got, they got some fake stream numbers. Streaming. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they got, they got a lot of streaming counts stripped. Oh, okay. And uh, and Spotify, one of the one of the main labels. So now it's much more protected. So you can't sort of yeah, diddle all the numbers. You, yeah, it's harder to diddle the numbers. You can't do any diddling. Yeah, well, you hear now that most artists make the majority of their money through touring because it's the only tangible way that they can, you know, physically get their music out there. Yeah, well, getting it out there, I think, well, certainly making money from it. Making you know? money from it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. From the intellectual property. Yeah, which is kind of good too, you know, because it's kind of like your. Um, I mean, it's 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 nice to know that people are putting a lot of effort into touring and performance and that mm-hmm. kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. So that's good. But did you did, did you go just going back to before with regards to how we get how we find out about music? Did you go to many live shows when you were that age? Uh, teenager. Yeah. Um. Or younger, but yeah. Because we're on the outskirts here, right? We're yeah, in, I don't Zealand. really. The, the really when I was a teenager, probably the the main you know way I got live music was to go to the state of it. Yeah, true. In town, and for those of you that don't know what the state of it was, but it was a a live music venue that yeah. effectively catered for teenagers when I was a teenager. Yeah, and they had they didn't really they had the occasional big band. I think they had She Hard there. Mm. They had Gas Huffer mm. come across from the states. It was a punk ah. band from the US. Um. But mainly local acts, and it was just an excuse to drink rocket fuel and get hammered and smoke. And yep. basically, that was was a great time. Yeah, yeah. But I think my first big, big live concert that I went to see was Pearl Jam in ninety nine. Okay, yeah. Do you remember who was supporting them? No, I don't actually. Because sometimes that's an interesting one as well. Eh? You get you get you learn about new music from going to something like a festival and seeing some mm. bands that were there who who. You would never have heard of mm. back then. Who would who would sort of blow you away? So I guess like these days, when you have this recommended listening stuff with with Spotify, when they used to have things like the Big Day Out, you know, yeah, all of a sudden you'd see great. you'd see bands where you're like, "Whoa, who's that?" Were you saying that you saw the Living End at Big Day Out? Uh, yeah, I did see the Living End Big Day Out. 
Um, I saw so, heaps of bands that looked big. Day. Yeah, there's like three solid days, right? And then yeah. you see, so you would have seen some bands that you hadn't heard of since. Yeah, totally. Oh, sorry, beforehand. Yeah, 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 yeah. definitely, definitely. And and there went. I, I mean, I I struggle to think anything off offhand and off the top of my head, but I certainly would have seen bands that I'd never heard of before that I really liked. Yeah, and um, went and bought the CD. Yeah, yeah, from it. How about you, Tom? Did you? What, what can you remember? What concerts you went to? Yep, you, I went to. I remember going to um, – well, my, my, my parents took me to a bunch of classical concerts when I was little and, and, and that kind of stuff and musicals and that kind of thing. But I remember sort of doing a road trip to Hamilton to this Exotech concert when I was about 13. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Exotech was a metal show on the radio, actually quite an important one for, for I guess, bogans like myself in New Zealand when it came to hearing about what was kind of trending in the States with regards to heavy heavy music. Yeah, I'll be hitting record on a few of those. Me and some some mates of mine would would record those pretty religiously. But yeah, I remember going to that one and um, a big day out and just other live gigs and seeing um, support acts and, and that kind of stuff. That was a good way of of getting more things. Well, that's um, maybe we should have a bit of a, a talk through some tasting oh, notes here. Yes, yes, yeah. we should. While we've been sitting here we've been drinking the lovely Stables Reserve Natarawa Pinot Noir it's a bit of a different one tonight of course because uh, as you can hear from the music it's a little bit classier a little bit more refined we've, we've zhuzhed it up haven't we a little bit well we're doing the wine thing for the first time and uh, so Pete you're having a bit of a quaff now mm. what are you getting on the nose well this one? weirdly enough I think I'm getting apricots oh is that I'm getting that tang yeah, is that weird? No, that's not That's not weird. Stone fruits. And I'm not saying that. I have not read the label this time at all. Yeah. So, just a disclaimer there. Yeah, what vintage is this? Let's check it out. It is the 2019. Oh, 2019? Yeah. Great year. Great year, I hear. Yeah. yeah. It's before the cursed 2020. Yeah. It's, it's lovely. Yeah, are you a fan of white wine? Or you like you like a bit of red wine? Or um, it, I'll be honest, I'm not a connoisseur of wine per se. Uh, but red wine if I drink it. Yeah. So thank you for giving this, by the yeah. way. Yeah. <laughs> lovely. And Pinot Noir in particular is, is nice. It's more, I reckon, Pinot Noir is a more sort of a uh, a lighter wine. Yeah. And it, it sort of suits like, sort of springy summertime drinking, as opposed to winter where you want a, like a heavy Merlot or something. Yeah. Cabernet Sauvignon. Cabernet Sauvignon. Cabernet Sauvignon. Cabernet Sauvignon. Cabernet Sauvignon. You know? But um, yeah, I'll, I do enjoy a good nice pen and wine. It's quite light. Yeah. How about you, Tommy? What, what sort of flavours are you getting from this bad boy? Mmm. Well, I think. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm getting like a plummy, like a plumminess, like a. Mm. It's a it's a it's a stone fruit kind of thing as well. I mean, I do like wine. Um, I've always sort of called myself a beer and whiskey person, but like, uh, I, sp- I, I normally drink because I'm th- like if I'm thirsty it kind of has to be sort of thirst quenching so we're like a miami wine cooler or would you put a <laughs> would, you, would you put a nice chardonnay through the soda stream <laughs> nice you know it's so so normally well well the reason i say that is because normally i guess i'm not really that into red wine because it's like drinking room temperature when you're thirsty is not that not that awesome mm. but i normally like i like eating it i like uh, eating Dinner and, and having a glass of the dinner. That's good. Eh? Yeah, that is nice. Actually. Yeah. But this is a good one. Of course, it's local. Is it like a bridge par? Right? No, it's not totally. Yeah. That's out of bridge par. Mm. Yeah. I've never been there myself, actually. I've driven past it a few times. Ah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's a prime spot for uh, for going rabbiting, which, yes. of course, there's an epidemic going on right now in Napier with regards to rabbits. Isn't that everywhere? Yeah, we, well, I think I saw something recently just about Hawke's Bay alone. So we've got to get out there and check it out, Pete, and do these. Do these grapes a favour. Do our bit. Yeah, Barney. yeah. Take a couple of 22s out there and, um, yeah, get some dinner for the dogs. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. That's a nice one. Very good. I'm Love a fan it. of it. I, yeah. I'm thoroughly enjoying it. It's very, very nice. <laughs> very nice indeed. Awesome. So what about now, Pete, bringing us into, into these days? How do you find – because you've actually spoken a little bit before about how you feel like it's a little bit st- – Sort of more static, your musical preferences and tastes. Because uh, we've talked about how you sort of keep going back to things that happen in the formative years, those particular yeah. bands and stuff. I guess because, you know, 
you, so you, I think you touched on it before where you're not so heftily influenced by your peers as much anymore. Well, I yeah. it's certainly in my situation because I'm not yeah. in the music industry at all, yeah. you know, aside from the occasional performance, but um, generally no. So I don't really get a tap in from the people around me, mm. you know, aside from my wife who's very, very good at um, tapping into new music, which I'm not. Yeah. Um, and I guess that's why I tend to go back and I find it hard to shift along into new music. Certainly a lot harder than I would have found it, you know, 20 years ago. Yeah. So um, that, that's that's where I'm at with that. That's why I'm finding it quite static. But I do really enjoy new music, particularly, you know, if, if, so, if you like yourself, you've introduced new music to me and I, I really enjoy it. I love it. You know, and that gets yeah. to my big Spotify playlist. Have you seen that meme that's been going around? It's like people who show you new music are the best kind of people. <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, not a new meme, but it's a it's a meme that's sort of going around. But I guess maybe when you get older, you sort of get these naturally these gatekeepers, or not gatekeepers. Maybe that's the wrong word, but conduits that you sort of your go to person mm -hmm. or people for for getting music from. And right. So, who would that be for you? Wife is quite a good one. Um, well, there are a few people. There's a friend of my wife's, um, Belle. And she's got a really good taste in music. Her and her husband both do. And sometimes they send good stuff my way. And, um, yeah, but also the other thing, I work at a, a in a tertiary institution and, and a lot of the students give mm. quite good stuff. See, that, uh, that's an advantage where you have it yeah. for uh, exposure to music because you're around a lot of people who are mm. – um, obviously yourself, you're a practicing musician, but – you know, you're also around a lot of, you know, minds that are, are sort of tuned to learning a lot about different styles of music as well. So yeah. it would sort of put you in a position where you are going to be exposed to a lot of that sort of stuff. Yeah, and I'm quite thankful of it too. Like I think I like to start, for example, Tuesdays are, are quite a long day. In with, what way? And that I'm teaching all day one ah, year group. Yeah. So they're sick of me by the end of it. Um. Which is fine, but but it's kind of like I like to start it off with a bit of listening. Yeah, where I go, this is what I've been listening to, and just sort of you know absorbing what's the word, reflecting and med meditating on some this, music. Do you happening. start the day with meditation? Well, in a way, yeah, in a way, yoga mats. It's kind of Chakra like bells. Well, they're stretching, <laughs> 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 but that's me going ah, groaning, getting out of my chair. Yeah, no, I think it's a pretty good, pretty good way to start the day to 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 look for something new to listen to. I personally find it's quite exciting for the rest of the day if I'm sort of like, oh, I've got that to listen to when some students recommend some stuff. If I was going to be honest, it doesn't happen that often that they recommend something that I'm really, really that into. Really, every now and again, that makes the favorite list, and um, and I can look forward to thrashing it as soon as I. So as you're as I almost go. at the other end of the spectrum though, because you're bombarded with music all the time. Yeah, maybe. Whereas you haven't, you're probably not getting that sort of happy medium, right? Yeah. Have you ever played them drum flip? <laughs> Once or twice. Have you? In different years. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. And for the <laughs> listeners out there that haven't, YouTube drum flip strike, please. <laughs> it's it's definitely worth a watch. Yeah, not my not my finest moment. <laughs> I think it's one of your finest moments, actually. <laughs> it's pretty funny, eh? Yeah. The, yeah. the groin-mounted snare drum is... <laughs> Phenomenal. <laughs> yeah, it's real funny. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I still remember, still remember that pattern as well. <laughs> yeah? Yeah. We should get you to do a little live, live version one time. <laughs> Can't do the flips these days. No? Yeah, no, it's too tricky. I thought that was quite impressive. It's actually. a young man's game doing those flips, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> All right, well, should we, should, we, should we call it there? Yeah, I think so, Tom. Uh, it's been nice thinking about and reflecting on, I guess, maybe the challenges with procuring music back in the day. Mm. Sometimes you take it for granted, you know, with the, the ease of streaming these days and that kind of stuff, eh? You do wonder what the future holds. Because, mm. I mean, I never would have imagined 20 years ago this is where music is mm. in terms of accessibility. It'd be interesting to see yeah. another 20 years what it's actually like. Uploading straight into chips in our head, probably. Just straight there, eh? <laughs> yeah, the tinfoil, you know, get yeah. a bit of tinfoil out and away you <laughs> yeah, go. Man. Wired yeah. out of years. Something to look forward to. Eh? I'm looking forward to it. Okay. <laughs> All right, man. Good talking to you. You Pete. too, man. Uh, Till next time. See you guys later. Thanks for listening. Bye.